Welcome. The purpose of this video is to have a chat through uh, memory and storage, the first part of unit 1.2 in the specification. So you can then go through and do a few test questions to see whether or not you're happy with what we're doing. Now we're going to be looking at the idea of memory first and then storage second. So we're going to start off with memory. We're going to look at the idea of RAM and ROM, and we're going to explain the idea of virtual memory. This is our normal computer model, the idea of input, processing and then output and what we're going to be looking at is this idea of memory so the computer's ability while it's processing to be able to store information and then retrieve that information back which is pretty important we're going to come on later to look at the idea of secondary storage and how that plays a part this is what you'll see when you look inside the computer you'll see some cards like this these are ram cards okay which is referred to as random access memory most modern computers have very little ROM, and you'll see a few of those little chips um, on the motherboard of the computer. A random access memory, RAM, is what we consider to be the primary memory or primary storage sometimes referred to, okay? It can be read from, okay? So you can read obviously data from it, but it can also be written to. So it's a both write and read medium. It's also very, very fast. It's quite close to the processor. Okay, so the processor is able to get data to RAM and back again fairly quickly. And the key purpose of RAM is to store the operating system, okay, the system that the computer is using to run on, any software that's currently in use. So I'm currently using PowerPoint and some audio recording software and the data that's being stored, like the actual PowerPoint presentation itself. The key thing is that when you turn the power off, RAM loses all of its data. So it has to have a constant supply of power in order to work. Now in computer terms, we call that volatile, okay? So if any type of storage is volatile, it means that it needs constant power in order to work. Now, obviously that's no good at all. So we'll be talking later about storage, but storage devices are designed to mitigate that, they're designed to store the data between periods where your computer is on or off. So on most computers, the data is safely stored on the hard disk until we switch the computer on. The first thing the computer will do when it first switched on is that it will load the operating system. All right, you're used to the idea of your phone loading its operating system when you first switch it on or Windows loading or another operating system. Once that's loaded, we can start to do stuff, all right? We start to run applications. And so in this example, we've got the operating system loaded. We've also imagined that we've loaded up Word and Excel. We've done some copying and pasting. So there is some data um, stored in the clipboard. And we've also got some documents currently open as well. So the problem comes when we try to open another document. In this case, we're gonna try and open a browser. Now the browser is currently stored on the hard disk and we want to load that into memory. But if you look and see how much is there, not enough space. So the question is, what can the computer do? So the answer is to use the next available space. But on most modern computers, the hard disk will have an area set aside as what we call virtual memory. So in this case, the clipboard that we maybe don't necessarily need to have stored in memory at the moment is copied onto the hard disk. And the area of RAM that it was previously using is freed up. And that then allows the new application to be loaded from the hard disk and so it can run. The important thing is that nothing in the computer can actually be processed unless it's in RAM. So if we suddenly went to our Word document and hit paste, the computer would need to take something from here, maybe the browser, copy that into virtual memory, and then copy the clipboard back into RAM in order to be able to do what it needs to do. So the hard disk is used as a temporary overrun for memory when it's full. The consequence of virtual memory is that the more RAM you've got, the less likely this situation is to happen. If you have a computer with two gigabytes of RAM, for example, in a modern environment, that's going to fill up very, very quickly. Whereas if you have 16 gigs of RAM, you'll find that it won't get to this situation anywhere near as quickly. So virtual memory is very important as a kind of reserve to stop the computer coming up with messages like this. We've looked at the idea of RAM that's used moment by moment to store everything that the computer does while it's running. So where does ROM come in? We mentioned before that the first thing the computer does when it's switched on is to load the operating system from the hard disk into RAM because you have to have things in RAM in order to run. 
But that begs a question, doesn't it? How does it know how to load the operating system into RAM if the instructions that are being run in the computer have to be in RAM? Where do they come from? Well, the answer is ROM. Read-only memory is a way of having instructions hardwired into the computer that can only be read, hence read-only memory, in order to allow the computer to do basic things that it always does. So the first thing a computer will actually do after it's booted up and just checked what devices it has connected is to load the ROM program into memory and then start running that code. This is what's referred to as a basic input-output system or a BIOS. So as a little summary in your mind at this stage, ensuring that you can say what the differences are between RAM, ROM, and what the purpose of virtual memory is. Here we have the processor, which does have some of its own memory on board, the registers, as you found out in unit one. And also on board the processor, we have something called cache. And the purpose of cache is to store frequently used instructions so that we don't have to go any further to get them if we need them again. Further out from the processor, we have main memory or RAM, okay, often on separate cards, a little way away from the processor. Fairly quick, but certainly nowhere near as quick as the registers and the cache on the processor. And then well away from the processor, long way away, and much, much slower from a computing point of view is the hard disk. And that's used as emergency memory if we need it. Importantly, this red area here, anything in virtual memory, cannot be something that's currently running. It has to be something that might be needed in a little while, but is not actually needed at the moment. Now we've already looked at the idea of storage a little bit with the idea of virtual memory, that virtual memory is stored on a hard disk or some storage device. But we need to look at the idea of storage, why we actually need it, and in particular, different types of devices. So back to our original model with our main memory, secondary storage gives us an ability to store, store data as well um, that we're processing. Importantly, this green area shows the processing that happens when programs are actually run. Data for programs you're running, like your Word document or your PowerPoint presentation, if you want to turn the computer off, have to be saved to secondary storage. When you first start your program, you have to load the operating system and the programs and the data from secondary storage into main memory in order to be run. So first question here, are secondary storage devices volatile or non-volatile? Well, we know that RAM is volatile, that when we turn the power off, the data goes. The main purpose of secondary storage is to cope with that problem, is to provide a non-volatile location, a location where we can happily have no power and the data is still there. So one of the purposes of secondary storage is to store data when the power is off. The other aspect of secondary storage is that it's usually orders of magnitude larger than RAM. A typical modern computer will have eight gig or 16 gig of RAM, but will often have hundreds of gigabytes of storage, possibly terabytes of storage to store data on. A bit like everything in life, each type has advantages and disadvantages, and some are expensive and some are cheap. And that's the key issue. It depends what your data is and what its purpose is, what type of secondary storage you would choose. The technical methods of storage for secondary storage broadly fit into three categories. We have magnetic storage. This is where the data is often stored on plastic disks or plastic tape with incredibly small particles which are magnetically charged. We then have optical disks where lasers read and write data. And we have the idea of solid state devices, which are basic devices that have memory chips on them, no moving parts at all. Let's have a look at a few of these. First of all, the idea of magnetic disks. One of the key things about magnetic disks is that data is stored in what we call concentric circles. So very often from the center outwards, we have tracks which go around the disk and then we move on to the next track. In a modern hard drive, there's often more than one actual disk inside. And this is an example of the inside of a modern hard disk. You'll see the read write arm is able to be moved to any position along the surface of the disk. And the read write head is at the very end. And there's several of these on this kind of arm which moves. Now, because it's mechanical, in order to get to data, you have to spin the disk and you also have to move this arm. So there's a certain amount of what we call seek time in getting data from a hard disk. One of the key issues with hard disks and why they're still used is that their capacity and therefore their cost value is incredibly good. We note here up to six terabytes. This 
presentation is actually slightly out of date. People still carry around portable hard drives because of the capacity and their portability. And the original iPod had, similar to this, very, very small miniature hard drive physically stored in it. That's now been generally replaced with solid state drives, but you can still see in certain devices physical hard drives because of the capacity that they're able to store. So key advantages of magnetic storage, they're cheap. Okay, The technology is so established, the factories and things that make it have all been paid for. So the technology is incredibly, incredibly cheap and vast storage capacity. Disadvantages, mechanical parts, okay? Because everything is moving, all right? Anything that moves mechanically wears out, okay? So durability is an issue. They're also incredibly fragile, so it's one sealed unit and not hugely portable because they tend to be fairly heavy. Common uses still used in personal computers for large storage. So although we tend to use other devices for um, main storage nowadays, a lot of computers come with hard disk for sheer volume of storage. The second category you need to know about is optical storage. Okay, it's less used nowadays, but still used for distributing games. Unlike hard drives, the tracks are stored in a spiral pattern from the inside outwards. And optical disks are read using a laser. So if the light is hitting the surface of the disk, it will bounce back, hit a prism, and be picked up by the sensor. If there's a pit, so because the laser light will go further, it will bounce back at a different angle and it won't hit the sensor. And that allows us to get ones and zeros stored. So here we can see data stored in a miniature st scale on the surface of a CD. Optical disks are incredibly cheap to produce. Storage capacity is not great. So that's one of the key disadvantages. They're also incredibly easily damaged. To write disks, we have to burn dark marks onto the surface of the disk in order to simulate the absorption of the laser light rather than there being a physical pit. And that process is a chemical reaction which takes quite a bit of time. So writing to a writable disk is relatively slow. Still used by people in a lot of cases for backing up data because it's relatively cheap to be able to store you know, terabytes of data using a bunch of disks. The key difference between things like compact discs and DVD and of course Blu-ray is literally how small the pits are and how close the tracks are. And because it's read using laser light, different wavelengths have to be used to read the disc. Blue laser light has a much smaller wavelength, so it's able to distinguish between the different tracks when they're much, much narrower. Now, we're all familiar with solid state drives. The majority of modern computers boot up using an SSD. So as a hard drive, we'll get up to about 70 megabytes of data per second. A modern cable plugged in SSD will reach up to speeds of, sort of 300 to 600 megabits per second. And a modern M.2 drive will reach speeds of several thousand megabytes per second. Incredibly good for getting the operating system from the disk into main memory really quickly. Now, the technology is evolving incredibly quickly, but most flash memory technology essentially operates in this format. Now, in reality, in a lot of memory sticks and SSDs, these are piled and sandwiched on top of each other, but each individual cell has a place where a voltage can be applied. There's then an area where electrons can get trapped if they're pushed in. So by applying a voltage, some electrons get pushed through this barrier and get trapped in a central layer. And on the other side, you can detect whether there are electrons trapped in this area. And you may have heard of the fact that flash memory only has a certain number of ones and zeros that can be written to the disk and that after a certain amount of writes the disk will fail and the reason is because it becomes increasingly more difficult and you require increasing increasing currents in order to push electrons through this barrier so modern ssds are able to detect that additional voltage is required to push the electrons through the barrier and eventually they'll mark off a cell as being unwritable big advantages of ssds then they're highly durable, no moving parts, so you can move them around pretty much as much as possible. They are essentially chips like this. Very, very fast. Disadvantages, they're expensive, certainly when they're first produced at a particular capacity. Flash memory, which we're used to, um, these are low cost. They don't use anywhere near as good technology as SSDs, so they don't have these sort of caches and the memory controllers and things. They are literally just the memory storage but they're often used inside cameras, mobile phones, we have our USB sticks, and they're used for storing large quantities of data fairly cheaply and portably. 
So the issue of which device you use can come down to lots of different factors. Data capacity is one of them. If you're going to be storing lots and lots of video data, it's not going to be useful to, for example, store the data on a CD that's able to store very little data. Higher capacity disks will allow greater data storage. That's pretty obvious, but obviously will be more expensive. Let's run back to the objectives just to check that we've picked up all of those things. Do we know the difference between RAM and ROM? How they're used in a computer system? Why we need to use virtual memory? With storage, why do we need secondary storage? Do we understand the different types, optical, magnetic, and solid state, and roughly how they work? Given a particular storage device, can we discuss the relative capacities of those disks, how fast they are, their portability, so how easy it is to move them around, their durability, so how long they last, duration, and their reliability, and ultimately how much they cost. That gives you an overview of primary and secondary storage. So we're gonna add into the mix the idea that there is actually another stage, the idea of what we call tertiary storage, or what we call, sometimes call virtual storage. Now thinking back to primary storage or memory, we had the idea that if you run out of RAM, you can sneakily use the next stage, sneakily use secondary storage as extra RAM. So the question is, what happens if you run out of secondary storage, you know, if you run out of hard disk space? Or you want to back up your data and you don't want it to be physically in the same location? Well, you use virtual storage. And virtual storage, then, is the idea of online data storage, things like OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive. Essentially, it's still storage. It's still hard drives still actually a lot of the time real physical mechanical hard drives but it's storage on someone else's computer so next time you're using OneDrive just think I'm just using some virtual storage thanks for listening and make sure you've updated your notes to cover anything in this video that you didn't already know